but great. So I can see people are joining. Hope you can hear us all okay. Um, if you have any issues, do just send a message. Um, but yeah, you're all mic'd up. So hopefully the sound will be good for everyone who's joining online. Yeah, so I might uh, just kind of softly begin with just uh, an intro myself. Um, so my name is Katie. I'm the advocacy manager at Campaign Against Arms Trade. Um, I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. So um, we'll first have a presentation from Sam on the report. Um, so Sam is our research coordinator and um, yes, coordinated this report and is really the brains behind the operation on this one, I think it's fair to say. Um, and so yeah, I'll do full introductions later, but then we'll hear from Rona from Shadow World and Josh from Alcas for Human Rights, which is a Saudi human rights organization. Um, yeah, let me just see how we're good. Okay, so, oh yes. <laughs> and this is the, uh, the in-person real life version of the report, which is <laughs> also available online as a PDF in the other world. Um, and yes, there's graphs, there's information, there's thoughts. Um, lovely. Okay, so I think we've given people, I'd say there's people still joining, um, but I'm just gonna start with the introduction and um, we'll go from there. Uh, yeah, so I just quickly wanted to say as well, um, just a couple of reasons why I think the report is really important. Um, so first thing is that uh, the arms export system in the UK and also everywhere globally is quite complicated. Um, there is like a transparency gap here that's basically just yeah chronic throughout the entire system um, and very basic information that you think we'd be able to say we actually can't say like we can't say for sure how much of what is exported to where um, we can like use the information that we have to the best of our ability which I think Sam has absolutely done um, but you know you think that you'd be able to to put that together um, and the other thing is that the institutions that we have to monitor the arms trade are not fit for purpose. So, you know, we have weak oversight in parliament. Um, we, sometimes it seems like our calls for transparency are falling on deaf ears, despite the really serious human rights abuses that we all know have happened with UK um, arms exports. Um, and the other thing is that I think is, which I think is a huge deal as someone kind of who's really interested in arms exports is that it shows where all the information is if you are interested in exports. So I think that would be chapter um, chapter three, where it looks at all the different sources of data for UK arms exports. So apart from actually knowing about the trends for this year and the last five years, if from like a research point of view, advocacy point of view, you want to know like, where can I find information on arms exports? That chapter will tell you everything that you need to know. Um, and I think one other comment is, that you know, Sam approaches his work with such um, integrity and rigor. And I think the report is really transparent in saying like, this is where we know this much, but we don't know this bit. Um, and it's not trying to make sweeping claims that we know absolutely everything. And in like a world where I think we're really being given information in such a binary and um, false way, I think this report we hope is tackling not just the transparency gap, but like how to approach uh, knowledge sharing research um, and why we're doing it in the first place. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that is it from me. So I'll just quickly uh, do Sam's bio and introduce them. Um, and then Sam, I'll hand it over to you for the presentation. Um, so Sam is research coordinator at Campaign Against Arms Trade. Um, he focuses on UK arms exports and the political influence of the arms industry. Um, he's also a fellow at the World Peace Foundation and was previously with um, CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research research institution. Um, yeah, and Sam, will I hand over to you now? You're mic'd up. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. And thanks to everyone uh, who's here in person and online. Um, so as, as Katie said, the, the um, idea of this presentation is to um, bring together the different sources of information and data on UK arms exports that, that are available um, and provide our analysis and views on those exports. And I mean, we do what it says on the label, we campaign against the arms trade. So you can imagine that our views on them are generally negative, but for looking at some of the specific cases of, of greatest concern. Um, so, I'll go over the um, 
the main sources of data on UK arms exports and what each of those sources of data tells us in 2022. Um, taken individually, none of them give a complete, full, clear picture. Taken together, they still don't give a complete and full picture, but at least a bit more of a rounded view of what's going on. Um, so then I'll, I'll talk about the, these um, five particular cases of um, concern, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, USA, Turkey, and Ukraine, um, which happen to be the five biggest recipients according to one measure um, in 2022. Uh, there are different measures, as you'll find out, which measure different things and don't necessarily say the same thing. Um, uh, if there's time, I'll get on to some of the briefly part policy and parliamentary developments in 2022 relating to arms exports um, and, and then a bit about some of the recommendations we're making. So um, we'll start with the um, export license data. So export licenses are what you need as a company to carry out any exports of military equipment or dual use equipment. Um, government uh, assesses license applications against a, a variety of criteria which sound very good but in practice give the government a whole lot of leeway to basically do almost whatever they like. They publish data on these licenses in quarterly reports and also on an online database. There's a fair amount of detail on the sort of things that have been licensed. You know, there's descriptions like components for combat aircraft or something like that. Um, the categories on the military list, ML, the destinations, of course. Um, and for one certain type of license, single licenses, the value. Um, single individual export licenses allow you to export a fixed quantity and value of stuff. But there's also a number of different types of open licenses, which for the period they're valid, allow you to export as much as you like of the listed equipment, the listed destinations. And so they have no value attached because it, it could be uh, infinite or very, uh, or it could be very small. Uh, not infinite, that's actually impossible, but uh, <laughs> unlimited. Um, Open licenses often have a very long list of destinations and of item descriptions, types of equipment that are authorised, and absolutely no clue as to whether they're just exporting a little bit to a few of these countries on the list or lots to lots of countries on the list. So it's re that's a really huge transparency gap. So there's the government database, but there's also our browser, data browser that scrapes the data from the export control joint unit um, to give a much more fine grained picture and that's much more uh, user friendly. Um, and one thing that should be said is the government does not even collect data, let alone publish on what's actually delivered using any of these licenses. Um, we estimate by coming to other sources, which we'll get to, that about half of UK arms exports at least are made using open licenses, so aren't measured by the numerical value. I will just briefly um, switch to, um, oh dear, I'm, here we are new. I, I need to stop sharing. That's what I need to do, which means I need to do that. Yeah. Um, so just to briefly show you our database, you, you can take a look at the browser if you go to cat.org.uk um, and choose the UK export licenses browser, then you can see it and play with it for yourself at your leisure. Um, so I will continue with what this export license data actually shows for 2022. A total of eight and a half billion pounds worth of these single individual export licenses seals were issued in 2022, more than double the value in 2021. And it's the highest 
that it's ever been since they started reporting the total in, I think, 1998. Um, huge increase. Uh, 25 billion in the last five years. And again, that five year total is the highest that it's been. And you can see that the top destinations uh, were, were those five. Um, with Qatar, the, the, it was almost all the license for the Eurofighter Typhoons combat aircraft and the, the air to air missiles and stuff that go with them. Saudi Arabia, it's mostly. Uh, bombs and missiles or components for bombs, including the paveway guidance systems that's used for the paveway bombs that have been widely used to bomb Yemen. Uh, so they're replenishing their arsenal uh, after all that they've used in Yemen. The USA, Turkey and Ukraine. Um, an important thing to note about uh, the Ukraine figures is most of the military aid supplied to Ukraine is donations by the MOD, and that's subject to a crown exemption from export licensing. They still have to evaluate it against the criteria, but it doesn't show up in these export licensing figures. Uh, so that's the, the, the top 10. I'll, I'll make these, we'll make these slides, well, it's in the report as well, so you can see all the details there. Um, and the top 10 over the longer period, 2018 to 22. So there you see Saudi Arabia is, is the top one, followed by the US and then Qatar, and then Italy and India quite a way back. And um, let's get on to the uh, prettier pictures. So this is the value of the SEAL licenses every year since 2008. Um, so you can see the it, it jumps up and down, um, but a huge jump in 2022. And the red line is the five year average, the moving five year average. So you can see that's generally been trending upwards and that's continued this year. And this is a regional breakdown of where these licenses have gone to. So the majority to the Middle East uh, and then um, Europe. Asia, um, US and Canada and Asia Pacific are the next biggest, very little to Latin America or Africa. <clears throat> the next uh, piece of data that we have is data on um, contracts, which is collected by the UK Defence and Security Exports Agency, which is a dedicated arms export promotion agency within the Department of Tr Business and Trade. I don't think any other sector has such a dedicated unit in the Department for Business and Trade, despite the fact that arms exports are only a very small part of, of UK exports. Um, but the nice thing about this data that they publish on the value of contracts is that it doesn't depend on what sort of license they're using. So it includes a lot more than the, the, the value of those single licenses. Um, it's based on an annual survey and gives the total value of contracts. And UK DNSE reckon that they capture over 90% of the value of arms export contracts or defense exports, as they call them. The downside of this data, in contrast to the export license data, which is pretty detailed, is this has almost no detail. They don't even break it down by recipient. We asked them once if they could supply the figure specifically for Saudi Arabia for these contracts, and they refused on grounds of commercial confidentiality. Um, so just by region, Middle East this much, Europe this much, and so on. And they break it down into four categories, air, land, marine, and other. Um, so it really tells you very little except this total figure and the regional breakdown. Unfortunately, we don't have the data yet for 2022. They haven't released it yet. We did get some revisions to the data for 2020, for 2012 to 21. And we got even more when I sent an FOI because what they initially published in the revision didn't make sense. Um, so we now have a much clearer breakdown and that's all in the report. Again, this agrees with the export license data, Middle East, by far the biggest region. So what's this? This is a five-year rolling average going back to the 1980s. Um, 
in constant prices, so adjusted for inflation. And as you can see, again, with some dips, generally an upward trend, though it's flattened out the last couple of years. And there's the regional breakdown. Again, Middle East, North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, and a chunk here for unknown, which is what the revision provided, that some of the companies in the survey presumably just don't disclose the customers to UK DSE. So that's uh, about an, uh, an eighth or ninth. Uh, they don't know which region it's to. And this is showing the last 10 years, 12, 12 to 21, uh, the total value and breaking it down by regions. Um, so interesting thing is the last couple of years, the Middle East has really shrunk, um, which is perhaps a little surprising, um, but there we are. The next um, bit of data uh, to talk about is from Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. I used to help collect this data. Um, so their arms transfer database uh, has a lot of information, very systematic, comprehensive information on transfers of major conventional weapons. And I've listed there what that, uh, what that includes, planes, tanks, boats, and artillery missiles, and these other things. What it doesn't include is small arms and light weapons, components, most subsystems, even quite major subsystems, apart from the ones listed there, and military services. And that actually makes the UK go much lower down the list, because a lot of what the UK gets from arms exports is servicing the Saudi Air Force. BAE gets about 2.4, 2.5 billion a year just from that. Ongoing spare parts, maintenance, uh, technical support, whatever. So they compile a list of all the transfers from each country to each other country, and they allocate what's called a trend indicator value to it. It's their own measure. It's not um, a financial value. Lots of journalists quote it in dollars, and even NGOs who ought to know better sometimes um, don't talk about them as if they're dollars or anything like that. They're a, roughly an attempt to measure military value, not exactly, but you can read their methodology on their website. But it's the only source that breaks down arms trade data to the level of um, recipient and supplier for each year and gives a measure of it. So in 2022, the UK accounted for 3.2% of exports of major conventional weapons worldwide during 2018 to 2022, only the seventh largest, way down the list. The UK government usually claims we're the second biggest arms exporter. I reckon in terms of financial value, it's probably more like third or fourth these days. But um, uh, certainly be because so much of what the UK exports is components and services, the CITRI data puts us lower down. Um, the total for, for that five-year period was 35% down on the previous period. That's because between 2013 and 17, there were loads of typhoons being delivered to Saudi Arabia and Oman. However, if you just look at one year figure, they usually publish it in fives, but you can see the individual years. 2022 was well up, and that's mostly the typhoons to Qatar and the military aid to Ukraine. Um, and as I said, a lot not captured by CIPRI in, in this data. How are we doing for time? I should, I should not go on too much longer, probably. Um, these are the new orders. If you look at the trade register that the UK uh, had for major conventional weapons in 2022, that's one year rather than the five years that, that I identified. And... As you can see, it's not actually that much. Sonars, air refueling systems, some missiles. Um, the biggest thing was those three Type 31 frigates to Poland. But they're actually going to be made in Poland. So if you're saying this is a big job creator in Britain, it's not. Um, so uh, 
and then here's the, the, the graphs. And again, this is the TIV value, the not dollars. Um, uh, the blue line is the year to year figure, which, as you can see, is quite lumpy. And the red line is the um, is the five year average. Uh, and as you can see, it's been actually going down. So even as UK arms exports in value have been going up, in terms of what CIPRI measures as the volume of major conventional weapons, it's been going down. So that suggests the sort of nature of the UK arms trade has been shifting somewhat. In fact, the 2021 five-year average was the lowest it's ever been since 1950, uh, when they, the data starts. Which, so it's sort of quite curious that and these are the major recipients in the five-year period 2018 to 22 the biggest us then qatar saudi arabia india and ukraine and then for the rest asia pacific a big uh, recipient region europe fair amount to south america there was there was a big uh, second-hand helicopter carrier that was sold to Brazil, HMS Ocean, and so that that uh, is a large part of that. And virtually nothing to Africa, uh, as you can see. Um, I'm going to skip over these other sources of in info. The one that's sort of most useful in terms of financial value is the, the, the BA, BA Systems Annual Report, which tells us what they make from Saudi, and which in particular tells us there's a lot of arms exports that are going on that aren't captured by the SEALs. So uh, talking about some of these cases of concern, um, as I say, Qatar... Uh, it's the the typhoons, the big thing. It is a highly authoritarian regime. Their human rights are awful. It's sort of ironic. One of the first purposes, missions of the Eurofighters was aerial security for the World Cup, um, building the stadiums for which uh, large numbers of migrant workers died due to the appalling conditions they had to work in. Another concern is there is no transparency uh, or accountability around Qatar's military spending and arms procurement. Uh, they have an F rating from Transparency International indicating a critical corruption risk. We have no specific evidence of corruption in this particular de de deal, but let's say BAE has a track record in this area and it's not a good one. Saudi Arabia, which Josh will talk about a lot more, um, we've talked about that quite a bit. Um, one of the, the, the biggest concerns is that they're trying to sell more typhoons. They had a sort of initial memorandum of intent in 2018, which has never turned into a contract, partly because of Yemen, partly because of Khashoggi. But now they're, they, they, they think that everyone's forgotten about Khashoggi. So, uh, and there's a truce in Yemen, albeit a very shaky one. So they are very much hoping to go ahead with that. The only thing really stopping them is the Germans. So um, moment, yay for Germany. Um, Turkey, uh, increasingly repressive regime um, in and ongoing conflict. I just saw more news articles about what's been going on in Syria, bombing of uh, Kurdish groups in Syria. And they are selling drones with UK components in them, critical UK technology in them, to some of the worst conflicts around the world, um, including Azerbaijan, where we've just seen the, the mass ethnic cleaning in the, the uh, nagorno karabakh Ethiopia, where there's been pretty much genocide in Tigray. Um, and these drones are selling like hotcakes around the world, and they depended on British technology. Ukraine, um, it's an unusual case. Uh, usually we're talking about UK arm, uh, arming clearly the bad guys and you know Ukraine are defending themselves from invasion. And we can see there are different arguments here and we understand sort of why some in the peace movement would say absolutely no, never. And others would say, well, this is kind of an exception. But Regardless of this, we think that there are still issues to be raised about the way that the arms uh, sales are being made or, or the arms donations are being made. 
that should be addressed uh, if this isn't going to make things even worse. Um, there's poor transparency. They've said that they're going to keep secret uh, deals which they do when they buy from overseas for weapons to go to Ukraine. And that could mean they're using all sorts of dodgy brokers um, with a big risk of corruption. And we know what happens when you've got urgent procurement. We saw it with the COVID procurement. And we saw it with America in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was wasteful and corrupt. So really transparency is important. The other, another thing that's really important is making sure that these arms stay in Ukraine and used by the Ukrainian armed forces if they're gonna be used by anyone. And while the US and the EU have at least done something to do this, as Ukraine again has a pretty poor track record in this area, the UK won't even say, the MOD won't even say in reply to an FOI if uh, they have any measures in place or not. They're keeping it, which suggests to me that they don't, but don't want to admit it. Um, I think I've been going on enough. I, I could go, go on about the USA as well and all sorts of other stuff, um, but I'll have to leave you to uh, read all that in the report. So I will finish for now. Um, Thanks very much, Sam. And uh... stop sharing and pass back. Okay. That was yeah, so fascinating. And I think what keeps, um, which like I've thought before, but how you're describing the data really reminds me of this is that there's the there's arms as like weapons as material, and then there's arms as a kind of like a political capital. And once you start like looking at the data and then kind of doing a parallel political analysis, it really shows us so much more about different like different aspects of conflict, different aspects of human right, rights, and also particularly, I think maybe there's no denying that the Western world is a party to conflict. If the UK government are saying themselves that we're the second biggest exporter of military goods, you know, which is the type of posturing that the data doesn't even necessarily um, support. But then when you look at that kind of, we, well, now we'll do components, now we'll do more servicing that like adds this kind of hidden um, element to the whole system, which allows it to function like that. So I think, you know, whether you're, working specifically on arms exports or you're on something working on something else understanding this is key to kind of so many different types of advocacy so um thank you for all the work that you've put in uh and now i'm going to hand this over to rona so i'll just introduce rona um so rona mitchy joined shadow world investigations i think we have a few more shadow world people here um uh where back in 2019 and she's now director of projects and planning um so she manages and supports projects strategy and operations she's also mm -hmm. co-founder and coordinator of the corruption tracker and was listed as an emerging expert by the forum on the arms trade in 2022 um she's also a member of the cat steering committee which we are delighted about um and before joining Joining Shadow World, Rona worked as clinic coordinator at the Free Legal Advice Service in Islington Law Centre. Um, Rona, great, I'll pass it over to you. And if you want to bring that mic a little bit closer um, to you, just, yeah, for lovely. Yeah. Oh, would that be better? Okay, sorry. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I would like to start off by Extending a huge congratulations to you and to Sam and to everyone at Campaign Against the Arms Trade for an uh, incredibly, incredibly p impressive report. Um, I think it's especially useful for someone like me who works and uh, campaigns on arms export controls and against the arms trade, uh, but has is less accustomed to doing the deep dives into the data to have such a good uh, summary, but also the analysis of what the data shows, but also where that data comes from and the extent to which it's useful and what limitations there are there. Um, I'm really looking forward to discussing the report uh, with you all today, especially the recommendations made in the report around the regulation of brokers, um, the language used by the government in their supposedly robust um, arms export control system, and how uh, we as campaigners can use the information from the report to further our own work. 
On um, arms brokers, it's great to have reports that highlight in any capacity the use of and the controls or lack of controls on brokers or intermediaries in the arms trade. Uh, brokers form a really crucial part of the um, lateral networks of the arms trade, just as much a part of them as the uh, government officials and private or state companies that we talk so much about. In fact, the presence of brokers in armed deals often facilitates a range of bad practices and corruption and can often serve to further obscure the flows of money and weapons across the lifetime of a deal. And yet they remain hugely underregulated. Um, Campaign Against the Arms Trades report highlights the lack of transparency around brokerage licenses, especially in the case study on Ukraine, as Sam was saying. It shows in that case study that a significant portion of the arms that the UK is sending into Ukraine are being sourced overseas. And this means that there is no way for the public to know where those arms are coming from, who the third parties and brokers are who are being used and what weapons they're sourcing. Um, there was recently reports uh, to give an example of what practice this can um, mean in the arms trade. In the US of an arms dealer in Florida who is using Pentagon money uh, earmarked for aid to Ukraine, to source Soviet era ammunition and weapons from Eastern Europe and donate them on to Ukraine um, at massive, sourcing them at massively inflated prices because he has the backing of the Pentagon budget. Um, and in this case, he has a, a friend and financially incentivized friend who is by all accounts, a senior military official in the Ukrainian army who has managed to set up meetings of all kinds. Um, the report is not clear. It says that at the very least, this is uh, testing the boundaries of um, Ukrainian and US anti-corruption laws, but it does say that this arms dealer was previously indicted by the FBI on corruption, um, although got off on a technicality. Um, I think that this is just one example of what the report shows in this situation, which is that a lack of robust regulation for intermediaries just means a higher risk of corruption and also diversion and makes for an even more lax um, uh, export control environment, excuse me. As Sam mentioned earlier, when a broker is used in a case like this to source weapons for overseas, it doesn't matter whether it's UK or US money. If the weapons come from one country via an intermediary into the buyer country, in this case, Ukraine, then they are not subject to the UK um, export controls. Um, if states are serious then about harm prevention and about reducing the risk of diversion, then we need much more explicit regulation in this area. At very least, the recommendations in CAT's report about publishing all information on brokerage licenses and third party contracts, but also the broader recommendations made, such as those around turning the Committee on Arms Export Controls into a full standing committee, would serve to increase over site hugely. As well as these important recommendations, I do also want to touch upon a structural issue that the report highlighted for me. Um, there is a clear disconnect between the government's claims that their system is rigorous and robust and the reality as shown by even their own data. Um, the system, essentially, as the, the report states very explicitly, has a predisposition to approving arms exports in all cases, but especially where there is an existing political relationship between the UK and the buyer country. The reason for this predisposition, well, one reason, but a significant reason, is the intentional manipulation of language by UK lawmakers. 
since the judicial review brought by CAT, and it's no coincidence that this is since that judicial review, uh, there have been changes in the language used in the evaluation uh, criteria. Uh, one very significant one is in several criteria, the language has shifted from um, arms exports um, not being approved if there exists a clear risk, for example, a clear risk that they might be used in the violation of international humanitarian law, um, from a clear risk to whether the government determines that there is a risk, which is a pretty stark attempt by the government to give themselves a bit of wiggle room and probably to protect themselves from future legal challenges like the one brought by CAT. Um, but the, this manipulation of language and of um, relatively common sense language, you would think, goes further. Within the recent court case, the government was able to successfully argue that um, the in the war in Yemen, that instances that were brought to them of the intentional targeting of civilians were within the margin of what they might expect in a conflict of that nature. Now, the question then seems fairly obvious, which is how can you say that you expect a certain number of civilian deaths without determining that there is a clear risk of civilian deaths in a conflict of that nature? Um, it's just a an example to show the length to which even language has been appropriated and twisted uh, beyond a common sense interpretation uh, in the laws that govern us, that govern us in society. Ultimately, what this does, um, this uh, arms export control environment does, is it serves the interest of both government and the private industry. Uh, the government has determined that um, arms exports are a strategic priority for them. And so arms exporters now know that they are free, especially if they focus on buyer countries that have a pre-existing strategic relationship with the UK, free to continue to export weapons into conflict and to profit for millions and millions from death and repression across the world. So, and I'll wrap up by just saying, how do we as campaigners use a report like this in our work? I think that one example that this twisting of, one, sorry, one advantage that this twisting of language does give to us is that the, the logic behind the, some of these decisions does unravel very quickly, where as soon as given a little bit of scrutiny, um, it takes that common sense lens and the data in this report does not need any manipulation to show that there is a failure in our arms export control system. And that failure in itself also clearly presents an environment and a world where arms exports are making us across the world far less rather than more safe. I think that ultimately we need to be shifting the narrative on security and showing that it's not dependent on military power, but is instead a common value to which all people have equal claim and that ultimately security should be thought of in the long term sense of security for our planet, uh, peace and equality. Thank you so much. Um, Rona, thank you so much. That was so insightful. And I think, I don't know, really moving as well, because I think it's about taking, like you said, taking the data and bringing it somewhere where, you know, how can, as a campaigner, can I use this? And how you address the issues with Ukraine as well. You know, like, I think we are in a time of a political discourse where everything is so polarized that it prevents people from engaging critically with power structures and that like you said the the militaristic um system that we're working with serves vested interests and those interests will continue to serve themselves in our name while leaving you know really long legacies of um of suffering and horror and unfortunately you don't need to be old um to we, like, we've already like you know you can be under 35 and you'll have lived through um the war in iraq the war in afghanistan now ukraine um and you don't have to be from any of those places to be uh, a party um 
to what's happened there. So, you know, I think everything that we listen to at the moment is kind of about such uh, extreme urgency in a way that doesn't give us any space to think critically. And I think like what you've done just there was actually yeah really uh, moving. So thank you. Um, loads to reflect on. Um, so last but not least, we've got uh, Josh. Um, so Josh Cooper is a Deputy Executive Director director at Alcus for Human Rights. Um, he joined Alcus in late 2018. Um, before that, he worked for the Council of Arab British Understanding um, and with Amni Amnesty International's Gulf team. Um, he has a degree in Arabic and Middle Eastern studies from Exeter University uh, and a master's in politics of conflict, rights and justice from SOAS. Um, thanks very much. I'll just pass the mic on to you, Josh. Great. Thank you, Katie and Sam. And just to reiterate, um, it's a pleasure to be here on the occasion of Kat's annual report. And Kat is a long-standing and great admired partner of Alpis. Um, and Alpis is a human rights organization set up by Saudi human rights defender Yahya Siri, 2014. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm obviously not Saudi, but we have a number of Saudi colleagues. So kind of a big part of our work is getting access to information on the ground. Um, so today I'll just be, be speaking primarily yeah, about the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia as one of the UK's largest um, uh, recipients of arms, although last year was pipped by Qatar, um, and how this pertains to UK Saudi policy as a whole, including in relation to arms, but also sort of across the board. Um, so maybe, uh, yeah, hopefully this will have some parallels with other countries as a sort of case study. Um, but firstly, to discuss the human rights situation in Saudi, which I'm sure is not unfamiliar to you all, so I won't go into too much detail, um, but we all know yeah, about prevailing human rights uh, issues in Saudi Arabia and across the Gulf and wider region. Of course, the starting point has been very low. Saudi, um, since its establishment over 90 years ago, has uh, always been an absolute monarchy, um, where without political representation, without uh, basic liberties, uh, liberties. Um, but to emphasize the level of repression has really escalated since King Salman came to the throne in 2015 and his son, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, assumed power in 2017. And contrary to their claims of liberal reform, they've in fact uh, brutally cracked down on all forms of dissent. Uh, Al-Qis, like CAP, with its annual report on, on the arms trades, carries out a report on the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia. And in recent years, the titles of these reports have made quite grim readings, as well as the findings of the reports with things like yeah, intensified repression and human rights at an all-time low and things like that. And I don't think this is hyperbolic, but in fact, just reflective of the gravity of the situation, of the scale, of the lines the Saudi authorities continue to cross. Uh, and when there are positive trends, we're the first to applaud them and, and welcome them. Um, for instance, in 2020, at a time when the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia was hosting the G20, and just ahead of um, the US uh, administration, the um, uh, the Biden administration coming to power and sort of promises of US taking a bit more of a critical stand to Saudi in comparison to Trump. There were, yeah, sort of a couple of grounds for optimism with, say, the number of executions falling considerably and a number of prominent activists um, given more lenient sentences and then released from prison. Uh, however, since then, and as uh, this um, relative spotlight on Saudi at that time has kind of faded again. We've again seen the crackdown intensify further. Um, and this has been the case sort of since Biden's uh, campaign promises to hold Saudi Arabia to account as a sort of prior state failed to materialize. And then in the context of the Ukraine war and kind of changing ge geopolitical uh, um, circumstances again, yeah, the situation has, has worsened in Saudi. And taking just a few examples and a couple of thematic areas on free, free expression, there's been a real escalated crackdown on um, people expressing their uh, free speech, particularly online in the last couple of years. Um, a couple of prominent cases include Saudi aid worker Abdurrahman Sadhan, who was sentenced to 20 years in prison on the basis of tweets. Uh, his case, actually, his identity was revealed by the Saudis infiltrating uh, Twitter in a case that might be familiar, and there's still a court case um, being brought against them there. 
against Twitter. And last year, we saw, again, another wave of increasingly harsh sentences against activists and other uh, Saudi individuals just for tweets and social media activities, such as um, uh, a PhD student, actually, who was studying at Leeds University, Salma al-Shahab, who was sentenced to 34 years in jail. Uh, Noura al-Qahdani, a Saudi woman of 45 years, who was sentenced to 45 years in jail. I mean, the sentences are so random and arbitrary, and we've seen like they were being based on their age, because yeah, Noura, 45 years, and Salma Shahab, 34 years, sentenced 34 years in jail. Um, and this continues to this day. Um, a recent escalation was a Saudi man, a 54-year-old retired teacher who was sentenced to death uh, on the basis of tweets and activity on, on YouTube, um, peaceful activity. Uh, his account on, on Twitter has less than 10 followers, um, but he was sentenced to death. Uh, his was a case actually that came up in an interview with Fox News and Mohammed bin Salman a couple of weeks ago in which the Crown Prince was asked about this case and he um, said that indeed it, that it's a shameful case but he blamed the judiciary and that there are these laws in Saudi that he's trying to reform but um, it's nothing to do with him which of course has been pointed out by uh, human rights activists and others that in fact these laws, for instance, the county terrorism law came into effect in 2017 when MBS assumed power. So he's very much behind yeah, all of these abuses. Um, a couple of other examples on the death penalty, despite pledges to curb its use. Uh, last year, we saw 196 executions, one of the largest in sa recent Saudi history. This year alone, there's already been 110. Uh, that includes uh, death sentences issued for individuals accused of crimes committed as uh, children, despite the Saudis promising to end this practice. And it includes death sentences against members of a tribe, the Huayta tribe, who were uh, uh, forcibly forcibly evicted um, when protesting uh, uh, their eviction to make way for the Mega City Neon project and five of them have been sentenced to death. Uh, dozens of others are facing long prison terms. And despite uh, claims of liberal reform, for instance, in relation to women's rights, women are still being uh, sentenced and tried for uh, tweeting feminist hashtags, for wearing certain clothes. And of course, with yeah, migrant worker rights and a whole other suite of issues, we've seen appalling violations come to light, for instance, with the mass killing of Ethiopian migrants on the Saudi border. Um, so this is just a little snapshot of re real kind of recent trends showing uh, that these are very much yeah escalating issues, very live issues. Um, and of course, all of them have um, huge bearings to the UK as a close ally of Saudi for decades and as a country with considerable diplomatic leverage uh, with which to press the Saudi authorities over such concerns. Right. However, at pretty much every policy level we've seen the UK take the opposite approach and to uh, blindly support Saudi Arabia. Um, so just taking a few different kind of policy areas as a kind of example on kind of raising human rights issues. Um, the UK often says, yeah, it raises these things in private, um, uh, yeah, ministerial level. Um, when you look at say the FCDO report, the UK assessment of the human rights situation in Saudi is fairly um, comprehensive, although it gives a bit of a positive kind of leaning on certain areas, but generally the UK yeah, raises these issues. It recognizes Saudi as a appalling record. It's a human rights priority country. Um, many officials on the ground, when you sort of speak to them, at least in my personal experience, they're quite engaged on different cases and updates, and they try and attend trials of prisoners of conscience in Saudi, even though the UK, like other um, foreign diplomats, have been denied access to Saudi courts uh, for several years. So there's kind of this stuff going on behind the scenes, which, okay, it's not quite with the resolve and force, um, forcible nature that we'd like to see. And particularly at a public level, this is all often done like in private. So you never quite know to what extent the UK is really pushing this. But uh, the main point is that I think this, this kind of, these efforts are really undercut by the other forms of outright blanket support that the UK is giving Saudi Arabia. Um, so looking at a few examples of this, uh, the UK has a long history of providing uh, different forms of security, judicial, military support to Saudi Arabia um, in terms of different like training programs um, to different um, branches of the Saudi 
um, uh, yeah, regime in terms of yeah, national guards, police, um, things like that. And it continues to this day, although a little bit like the arms industry itself, it's really masked in secrecy. Um, we don't know exactly where their money's going, but it's clear from research and journalistic work over the years that um, lots of the bodies who receive the support are themselves, yeah, unsurprisingly, um, perpetrating yeah, grave violations. For instance, the Saudi um, border police, who the UK have supported until now, as far as we know, they were the um, the, uh, the 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 forces, uh, yeah, committing mass killings of these Ethiopian migrants at the border. So we, yeah, don't know what was the nature of the support from the UK. Why is this still ongoing? So many questions like that. And the same with the judiciary. The UK has a memorandum of understanding with the Saudi judiciary, despite, um, and yeah, constantly says that um, it supports judicial reform and all of these kind of collaborative efforts, which sound great. But after, yeah, hearing of these cases of people being sentenced for decades in prison for tweets and sentenced to death, I mean, what, uh, what basis are they are they um, thinking that the Saudi judiciary is reforming and deserving of this? Um, so all of this kind of serves to really give a, an element yeah, of, of outright support to Saudi Arabia. Um, and this is particularly in terms of trade. Um, the UK, particularly since the um, departure from the European Union, has really tried to increase its trade with, um, the, with Saudi Arabia and other Gulf partners. And it seems to be yeah, the, the main priority uh, at the Conservative Party conference Last week, um, a defense, no, the trade minister actually was speaking on a panel with the Saudi ambassador and some other ambassadors from the Gulf and said the UK's priority when it comes to trade is the Gulf, the Gulf, the Gulf. So that's really what they're emphasizing now. Maybe that was a key factor in the UK's invite to Mohammed bin Salman um, recently, which yeah, we still don't know the, the dates of this. Um, but th this would be his first visit since the, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, and of course, international trade itself is, is not a bad thing and is important and legitimate, but um, needs to come with some conditions and um, due diligence. The FCDO says the UK supports the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, but it's not clear uh, what measures it's really doing to promote this. And in fact, in, in many examples, we see the UK again uh, outright um, encouraging uh, yeah, companies to trade with Saudi despite possible uh, rights concerns. For instance, in relation to this Neon Megacity project that I'm sure you're all aware about, the UK, there was a report um, that the UK has been actively encouraging companies to um, trade and to, to be involved with Neon despite yeah, the many allegations that I mentioned earlier of uh, yeah, local tribesmen being sentenced to death, being um, imprisoned, being forcibly displaced. And Elpis actually published a report about this earlier this year. Um, and again, just another example with the Newcastle sale, um, uh, the UK again has um, really actively encouraged this Saudi takeover, despite saying it's sort of beyond their scope. Um, and again, returning to arms, so I haven't talked much about arms, but I think this, yeah, kind of, um, is a similar story when it comes to arms. The UK isn't just kind of um, begrudgingly, yeah, sort of um, trading with Saudi, but it's um, really actively prioritizing it. And uh, like the example Sam shares with the UK pressuring Germany to not to veto this um, arms sale, it's really, yeah, on, on the other side of the spectrum. And of course, just to conclude, I mean, yeah, there are many recommendations on UK Saudi policy and it's not a zero sum game. And we, of course, don't expect the UK to sever ties overnight. But oh, yeah, on all these different pos policy areas, UK is just, yeah, way too far on the side of outright support. And um, yeah, could be using its leverage a lot more effectively, um, which would have, uh, yeah, positive bearing on the human rights situation and the UK's own interests. So yeah, I'll leave it there. But thanks very much. <laughs> Josh, thanks so much. Like, I think, like, listening to those sentences for decades in prison or for death sentences is really, it's really harrowing. But I think it's important that we, like, speak here what's actually happening and what the relationship is 
with UK trade and also with all of the like sports washing, tourism washing that's been ongoing for the last couple of years. You know, I think they're is always this kind of, uh, I guess we're being fed lies about how power structures work and we need to look at them for exactly what they are and call them out. Um, there is no substitute for, for justice and you can't just put a shiny golf tournament on it. You can't um, wrap it up in football, the Tory party conference. It, it doesn't even come, it's not a drop in the water to what should be done. Um, I think the, <laughs> what gives me hope, I guess, is that, you know, the kind of the Tory party line and like what how you described even that setup at that um that trade meeting is so far, I think, from what we recognize in like say our civil society communities, like amongst our families and friends, that it like in that sense it's completely unrepresentative of of us. And um yeah, I think the only thing that matches those sentences is like the bravery of Saudi activists to be speaking out when they know that they're in such a dangerous context. So um, thank you for, for everything that you shared. Um, we are running a little closer to time than we planned. So I'm going to uh, go plan to go over time by at least 10 minutes just for, for questions, because surely there's a couple, unless everyone has no questions. I know there's some in the chat. Um, so it's going to ask from the room as well. We might try to take a couple together. Um, but yeah, we won't go much longer than 15 minutes over time because I know everyone, uh, good timekeeping is always appreciated. Um, so are there any from the room at this moment in time? We, I know we have some in the chat as well. So, oh, uh, yeah, I've got one here. Um, Emily's just going to pass the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. That was really enlightening uh, from a variety of perspectives, actually. Uh, my name is Alex Buck and I work for Alcust with uh, Josh Cooper. Um, but it was nonetheless very, very um, enlightening for me personally to hear from this, um, from a, a different perspective. We don't deal with the kind of statistical information pertaining to arms sales as much as, as you guys. So thank you very much for all the information um, that you provided on that. Um, speaking pragmatically, with regards to the advocacy that you all carry out, with regards to engagement with the UK parliamentary process in this regard, have you found any particular mechanism, be it engagement with like the Committee on Arms Export Controls, for example, like worthwhile, worth dealing with, with regards to either pulling the issue of like open export licenses, for example, into the mainstream or pulling more information out about it? Like, where have the success stories been in terms of the mechanisms, if that makes sense? Like, you know, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, all really interesting and useful information there. Thank you very much from all of you. I was wondering why anyone not going to answer why they think, and having been some has been bought in from the cold as such, and now why he's having a state visit in the UK and why the US is more dealing with him again, no longer regarding as a prior. Thank you. So we might give these a go and then Emily, if you wanted to have a look at the online questions and read out a couple um, after, uh, I could quickly as well say something on the, the kind of parliamentary and the mechanism side. I mean, the Committee on Arms Exports Controlled actually had a unified voice in this past year of asking to be upgraded to a select committee. I think that's significant to at least get some um, like cross party messaging out of the committee and we can't let that like just disappear with this election um i think like speaking to colleagues there's kind of a bit of a it's hard to get that to be the issue on the agenda going into the election but in terms of like as um as kind of security and human rights movement that's what we need to be um putting pressure on i think the recommendations that we have in the report come under like four categories so that's like compliance transparency um parliamentary oversight and what would the last one be human and human rights of course <laughs> so easily forgotten um, uh, and those are like kind of technical but on purpose because they are like easily cross-party applicable they are somewhat technical but they actually would make a massive difference they're just they're not just kind of um for nothing so sorry, that's my answer to that question and then i'll pass on maybe uh, to everyone else. Mm. Uh, right Sure. Yeah, do you want to speak down or is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, I, I, I've got the mic. So, um, on on the why has Saudi been rehabilitated? Um, 
and MBS, despite uh, Khashoggi. Uh, I mean, in the UK, he was the Saudi Arabia was never out of favor. Um, and because the UK is so dependent on Saudi Arabia as a customer for arms and in particular combat aircraft, um, if it wasn't for Saudi Arabia, BAE Wharton, where those Eurofighters are made, would not have been able to keep going. And that would be a big problem in terms of the UK's, for the government, in terms of the UK's ability to make the next generation of fighter aircraft. So although there may be ways in which the UK does have leverage with Saudi due to the close relationship, in another way, Saudi has enormous leverage over the UK. Um, that's what caused the UK to go completely against international norms and treaties it signed up to when it cancelled a serious fraud office investigation into arms to Saudi Arabia. That angered the US, it angered the OECD, it angered even the financial community because Britain having a reputation for being soft on corruption is not good for, 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 the, for, for them. Um, but the relationship with Saudi was more important. For the US, for Biden, who promised to make MBS and Saudi a pariah, uh, I mean, that was campaign rhetoric, but it's a bit of a mystery when Saudi has not been going with US interests. When, uh, after the Ukraine invasion, um, Biden was basically pleading and fist bumping with MBS to keep up oil production, and instead they agreed with Russia to cut oil production. So I think it is just such a constant of the US foreign policy bubble that Saudi is essential, that they are a force for stability, that they ensure that the oil flows and that we, uh, you know, they're our allies, that it, it's a, a group thing that it's very hard for an, an administration to, to break out of. I think that's the only explanation I can offer, not being an actual policy insider. Um, yeah, I'm happy to add to a little to what Katie said as well, because I completely agree with her. I think that um, the nature, especially with the Committee on Arms Export Controls, the nature of a committee like that does mean that there are ebbs and flows of how far you can get with engagement. It very much depends on who the sitting MPs are. And now that there is a bit of unity to call for it to be um, a standing committee, I do think that that would increase the usefulness of engagement. We have also, both CAT and Shadow World Investigations in the past, used when the committee has been uh, particularly ineffective and at one point stopped speaking about Saudi Arabia altogether, would refuse to mention it, um, used it as a um, point to campaign around and we organized a people's cake committee on arms export controls which actually got significant media attention so you can even in the worst um the periods of least engagement also use that slightly to advantage as campaigners and kind of use it to get other attention Yeah, I'll maybe just add on the MBS rehabilitation. I yeah, agree with what Sam shared. And I think, yeah, as civil society and the wider public, say after the Khashoggi murder, kind of saw MBS for what he was. And that certainly hasn't changed. He was the individual who oversaw and approved the operation to kill and dismember uh, Jamal and has personally yeah, overseen torture in prison and carried out, yeah, really instigated lots of these abuses. So I think the public as a whole hasn't forgotten that, but uh, I guess yeah, the government has been all too quick to 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 yeah rely on on the kind of media cycle moving on and yeah to accept the Saudis kind of reformist narrative at face value. Um, yeah, just the other day I saw an article by Grant Shapps, the yeah defense minister, praising Saudis women's right, rights reforms and how wonderful it is um, that. Uh, yeah, all, all the changes taking place in Saudi um, and, yeah, just with, without any um, acknowledgement of, of the human rights concerns. Um, so I think, yeah, people like him and other key figures in this particular government and hopefully in a yeah new government, that, that won't be quite the same. Um, but I guess 
uh they are yeah sort of at, at the bottom dregs of the of the barrel and um uh yeah really desperate on trade and pushing different priorities there um but yeah that's fair sorry just one more point on the saudi british relationship and khashoggi and rehabilitation about four weeks after the khashoggi murder the foreign office had a meeting to discuss the ramifications of it with bae systems with an arms company we did an foi for the minutes we got a lot of black text and just uh, uh, you know black lines and just a little bit of what was actually there very little um but you know reading between all the lines of those blacked out text the meeting was about how do we deal with the bad publicity with the fallout from this to make sure that the arms keep flowing to make sure that this horrendous massive global public relations disaster doesn't force us to stop the arms sales that at any rate is my best guess as to what they were talking about okay so we've got um quite a number of questions online so i'm just gonna take a couple of them and i will try and type some of the answers to some of the others in the chat for people um so one of the questions that we've got are in terms of cat so what are the implications of the cat report for supporter campaigning priorities and we've also um, got a question sort of saying thanks for all the information and it was really good but they're finding it difficult to understand how on the one hand the arms trade only forms a small percentage of UK exports but watching the huge queues going in and out of the dicey arms fair this year um, you know I'll just quickly say something on that last um comment on you know that difference between it's a small part of the trade but there's you know huge volume of weapons and I think it kind of speaks to that like double meaning that arms have like you, even the way that you could say it's the volume of weapons or it's the amount of money that the contracts are worth all of these things speak to different power systems um so in one sense that shows us that there, we can easily have an economy that's not when we already have one that isn't dependent on arms exports as it stands, it's about kind of political power, about defense posturing. Um, and I think it was actually something that Josh said that reminded me of, I feel like campaigners and people who work in this field are always being told that we're so idealistic and we know nothing, but actually by this kind of like realist uh, approach, but we are the ones that are the most um, willing to take any gain, you know, any deal that doesn't go through is worth is worth the work, um, like the German uh, deal. And the fact that there is some move, like that Germany hasn't okayed it means that what we're doing is working. Um, or, you know, any one person that gets released from prison is worth the work. Um, so, you know, I think all of that kind of speaks to this like very muddy uh, um, system. But yeah, it's like power versus quantity kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'll just pass on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, campaign priorities. I mean, perhaps the campaigners uh, could answer that better, but I, I hope certainly this will be a valuable resource for CAT supporters and other civil society groups that working on these issues. Um, you know, what you what you do with it, that's, uh, that's up to you to some extent, but I'm sure that this, it will also be used for deciding, for working out some of our campaign priorities and strategies over the coming years, we're, we're working on that at the moment. The other thing to say about DSEI is it's an international arms fair. It's, there's a, a lot of British companies, by far the largest single number, but there were, um, I can't remember how many countries were represented there in terms of having companies from those countries exhibiting. There were 26 international pavilions. That is where countries had a whole big space where all their companies were based and which had, you know, maybe their own arms export promotion authorities and whatever else, government representatives. Um, so 
it, it's it's a, a place for bringing together buyers and sellers from all over the world. Um, so you know, Saudi, Turkish, you American, um, all, all over really. Perhaps not North Korea or Russian or Chinese um, can, can see all the arms that are on offer, all the new. Uh, developments and technologies that companies from around the world um, are presenting. As I say, these 26 other countries in the UK, which had enough companies there to be worth having a pavilion. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's much more than being about just UK arms exports. It's promoting the arms trade globally. Anyone else? Yeah, what I think is really interesting on this issue of um, the massive queues at Dicey um, and the kind of picture of the trading landscape is that another thing that is useful to pay attention to as campaigners is what um, the security companies and governments are um, happy to show off and to present in the clear light of day and what it is that they are trying to hide because we see that they are that it is not in their interest to be transparent or all of this data that Sam works so hard to pull a picture of together would be openly available but what they do want you to see is their big flash weapon systems that solidify their perceived certainly their perception of themselves as the UK as being a global power um the side of the arms trade that they don't want us to see is um almost everything that goes on underneath that they don't want us to see for example that um bae as has recently been recorded reported by commonwealth are only paying 15 percent of their own research costs and the rest is being funded by the uk state that's not that's not their idea of like a flash. They want you to think that they are creating jobs and that they are sustaining the UK economy. And it is absolutely not the case, no matter how flash. And they don't try and hide Dicey. You know, they're not even particularly stringent about which journalists that they let in. They are quite happy for the world to see what they consider to be flash. But it's the reality that goes on underneath that we need to focus our attention on. Uh, so just have a little question from from Roy over here. So that would be, I think, our last one, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Uh, I think. Yeah, it's just I wonder if everyone who's listening knows what you were talking about when you talk about the German, um, uh, what's going on with Germany and the UK and the sale of um, of uh, the aircraft. It might be worth mm -hmm. just explaining what's going on in there. Yes, uh, so the Eurofighter Typhoon combat aircraft is a collaboration between the UK, Germany, Italy and Spain. Um, different parts of it are made in each of the four countries and then each of the four countries has their own assembly line to put everything together to make the complete aircraft. Um, and each of the four countries manages its own exports. So Italy sold Eurofighters to Kuwait, and of course they had British and German and Spanish parts in them, and Britain sold them to Saudi and Oman and Qatar, and Germany sold them to Austria, but it required the cooperation of all four to build them. And that means that any of the four countries can, in principle, say no to an export. None of them have, up to now, but after the Khashoggi murder, Germany put in an arms embargo on Saudi Arabia. Under heavy British pressure, they agreed to make an exception for spare parts for that the um, that Britain was supplying to keep the Saudi typhoons going, which makes Germany also therefore complicit in the war in Yemen because without those spare parts, the aircraft stopped flying and stopped bombing. So that was a big concession. Um, recently, with the truce in Yemen, uh, Germany agreed to um, slightly loosen the um, arms embargo on Saudi Arabia, but not to agree still to new sales of Eurofighters. They'll still allow the maintenance of the old ones, the existing ones, but not the new ones. As I say, said, 
Britain and Saudi Arabia signed a memorandum of intent. That's not a contract. It's just we hope that there will be a contract soon in 2018 to sell 48 more. Uh, no, was it 48 or 72? 48 more um, typhoons. Um, but shortly after that, well, I mean, the, the war in Yemen was going on. Our court case was going on. And then Khashoggi was murdered. And Germany had their arms embargo, not the right time. Now the UK are making a big press to go for it again. They're lobbying the Germans heavily. The German coalition is said to be divided, that the Chancellor Olaf Scholz is open to it, but that the Greens are less keen. And frankly, you know, if the Green Party were to allow um, more sales of typhoons to Saudi Arabia, I suspect a lot of their supporters would be asking what they're actually for. Um, so we're actually trying, a, a group of NGOs are trying to get together an open letter to send to all the four governments, but in particular, we're thinking about Germany saying, you know, don't give in to this British bullying. You have your principles, stick by them. Um, yeah, and that's hope. I mean, we should be putting out some more information to our supporters on that soon so that you can campaign locally as well as kind of the open letter. Um, so we will actually have to wrap it up there um, because we're a couple of minutes over time. Um, but I just want to thank everyone so much um, for for coming, everyone online, everyone in person um, to Emily, Jim and Christian at the back doing like a really good job on the tech to John for setting up the room and providing snacks. I'm sorry, everyone online that you didn't have any snacks, but I hope you have some at home. Um, and then especially to our two panelists and to Sam, um, I think like what's so important about meeting and discussing this type of research that is that it actually makes it come alive and makes you think like what can we do with it like not just by ourselves but together um and it gives me a lot of hope i think about where we can go so thank you and, yeah and just a final shout out to, to kirsten and, and, and jim at the back uh, in particular who spent hours on this because it turns out what you know that doing a hybrid uh no webinar and in-person event is it's quite complicated, actually. Yeah. There are lots of moving parts to make sure that the audio works uh, and the video works and the slide sharing works. And it's not at all straightforward. Yeah. Uh, we hope it has actually worked out. <laughs> but, you know, it required We're a lot of back. work uh, at, at the back. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.